the first warships of the Antares Confederacy entered into the sovereign territory of the Skrek at precisely midnight, Segalo time, on February 1st, 497 AL. Their crossing of the border had been perfectly timed to coincide with the Antares Treaty Organization's declaration of a state of war. This was the first stage of an interstellar offensive of such scope and consequence as to overshadow every campaign that came before. In a controversial decision, the first phase of the invasion, named Operation Sula Hadin, was not directed towards Earth or the United Terran Protectorates, but rather at the Skrek homeworlds themselves. While the Skrek had claimed a small collection of worlds, clandestine reconnaissance performed in the years and decades prior gave evidence that the conquest of two alone would decide the outcome of the war. The first was the political and industrial heart of their empire. It was a throne world completely enveloped in urban blight, whose name was roughly translated to mean the font of knowledge. This ecumenopolis alone likely once held a population several times larger than all of Antares, but now was a rotting shadow of its former glory. The role of the second target was less clear. Known simply as the Archives, it appeared to be a site of forgotten scientific research, where all the knowledge of the Skrek had been preserved. If these two worlds could be seized, it was estimated the Skrek, for all their power, would be forced to capitulate, and their hold over the United Terran Protectorates would be severed forever. Once this had been achieved, even partially, the second phase of the campaign, Operation Reyes, would redirect the Confederate Navy and Army into the heart of the Terran Protectorates themselves. Among the highest classified military secrets within Antares was the existence of a wormhole, a stable bridge linking together the Aldebaran system in the UTP with the Suhuri system in the Anthorian Republic. Confederate fleets could emerge undetected and within just a few short jumps of Earth itself. The scale of the campaign was such that the Intersar system, center of the Confederacy's military-industrial complex, had been almost wholly transformed into a single grand strategic center. From here, timetables and supply lines could be managed, and every effort made to secure victory. Yet, the greatest triumph had been won even before a state of war had been declared. Through every manner of political capital, the Antares Confederacy had secured for itself a place in the Galactic Council, head of the Greater Galactic Community. While the Council had dismissed the notion of some sort of galaxy-wide peacekeeping mission, the status afforded to Antares had nevertheless garnered the support of several other galactic powers. The United Dar Hesh Pact, an alliance of nations whose members had been ravaged by the Protectorates or the Skrek, together with the long-suffering Thymodian Republic, found common cause with Antares. No formal treaties were signed, but Antares would not go to war alone. The Skrek had assumed that Earth would be the first target, and when the Confederacy's fleets appeared within their territory, their own armadas were caught wildly out of position. Yet even outnumbered, what Skrek vessels remained were enormously advanced, slicing through Antares formations before they were destroyed utterly. The Battle of Regin, the largest of the fleet actions against the Skrek, was over before it began. Various Skrek armadas, racing back to defend their homeworlds, crashed against the combined might of Antares. Uncoordinated and wholly unprepared for the Confederacy's lightning advance, the Skrek had no hope of victory, yet the damage they inflicted was devastating. With the first foothold into Skrek territory, the Confederacy moved to secure their objective, almost unopposed. The battle for the Archives ended 290 years to the day that the CAS Earhart first slipped its moorings over Lindway and headed into the unknown. While only a token force remained to defend the planet, Confederate losses echoed those taken in orbit. Commanders on the ground had refused to preserve any Skrek data centers at the cost of their own soldiers, so while losses could have been far worse, the Archives had been damaged and fragmented beyond repair. With the last of the great fleets of the Skrek shattered in orbit of their worlds, or spread in disorganized formations across the galaxy, their ability to contest the landings on their homeworlds was over. A galaxy away, within the territory of the United Terran Protectorates, 
the other members of the Antares Treaty Organization, together with the Confederacy's new allies in the Dahesh Pact and the Thymodian Republic, had made unexpected progress. A full third of the UTP star systems had been seized, and powerful fleets of warships seemed poised to take its core star systems. To support this welcome success, the second stage of the campaign commenced ahead of schedule. Three Confederate fleets were redeployed through the Anthorian wormhole, and for the first time, entered a region of space their now distant ancestors had once dreamed of exploring themselves. The Confederate invasion of the United Terran Protectorates now began in earnest. Back within the Skrek Theater, 19 full army groups and many further independent field armies were deployed to the font of knowledge, throne world of the Skrek Empire. Automated defenses, slave armies, and even some of the Skrek themselves rose against the Confederate advance, but for all their ancient knowledge and technological terrors, the planet's defenders were outmatched. Any martial spirit the Skrek once possessed had been softened by a millennia of opulence, and they faced a military apparatus whose wars of liberation had come to define their entire nation. Still, the Confederacy fought for every towering spire that rose into the atmosphere, every continent-sized labyrinth of decaying structures and collapsed transit routes. It was a battlefield of astonishing scale, methodically isolated and occupied day by day, month by month. When news that the font of knowledge had fallen reached the Confederate fleets and armies advancing within the United Terran Protectorates, the war had seemingly arrived at its inevitable end. Terran resistance had grown weaker and less organized, and all that remained was to determine which nation would have the honor of seizing the solar system. Antares was poised to arrive first. Its liberation fleets had pushed as far as Bernard's star, less than six light years away from Earth itself. The great liberation for which generations had dreamed, worked, sacrificed, and fought had finally arrived. The Terran counterattack destroyed centuries of planning in a single stroke. Vast armadas, dwarfing those of the Confederacy and its allies, appeared seemingly from nowhere. In the Battle of Bernard's Star, two Confederate battle groups were routed by superior Protectorate forces, and a third fleet similarly shattered during the Battle of Alpha Centauri. Everywhere, the victory that had seemed so certain began to slip away. Allied fleets were routed by Terran reinforcements, Scattered Skrek task forces seized undefended systems. The Skrek in particular had embraced a campaign of terror, targeting the Confederacy's allies in calculated acts of destruction. While the last remnants of their ancient armadas had little hope of meeting the Confederacy in a pitched fleet action, they were more than suited towards ravaging undefended worlds and trade routes. Both the Commonwealth of Vitalas and the Commonwealth of Ventin Vita suffered greatly, with both their own forces and those of Antares too distant to effectively resist. On December 20th, 501 AL, four years after the campaign began, the Confederate High Command ordered a complete withdrawal from Protectorate space. The Strategic Reserve was activated, and every effort made to protect the Confederacy's allies. To abandon the liberation of Earth when its fleets had been so close was a heart-wrenching decision for both the highest generals and admirals within the Antares military, and the billions of citizens who had long awaited a second reunification day. But there could be no honor in liberating Earth if it came at the cost of those the Confederacy had sworn to defend. The eruption of another terrible robotic uprising, this time against the Anthorian Republic, was a further devastating blow to the Confederacy's morale. With the worlds of its most powerful ally turned into battlegrounds and its people massacred, the Confederacy struggled to hold the line against the United Terran Protectorates. Countless ships were lost in battles on both sides of the wormhole, while everywhere, scattered Confederate task forces, armies, and lone ships fled ahead of Terran battle groups in a desperate attempt to regroup. For a perilous 19 months, it seemed like the whole of the Confederacy collapsed, as it struggled to retake the initiative on multiple fronts. The revelation that secret negotiations between Antares and the United Terran Protectorates had taken place was yet another terrible burden for the nation to bear. The armistice was signed while the decisive battle between the Confederacy and the Protectorates still raged, 
a move that likely saved another of Antares' greatest fleets from annihilation. The worlds of the Skrek would be turned over to the Confederacy, and the last of the Skrek war criminals hunted down, but neither the Antares Treaty Organization nor its wartime allies would be granted any claim over Terran territory. It was not the end to the conflict they had imagined, but with the great effort needed not only to preserve its allies but integrate the vast domains of the Skrek, Antares was left with no other options. Within days of signing the treaty that fully ended the war between the Protectorates and the Confederacy, the Greater Terran Empire was proclaimed. In a single stroke, Antares had freed Earth from the hold of the Skrek, only to see it become the center of something even worse. Antares intelligence would spend decades analyzing if that hadn't been the goal of the Protectorates all along. The terrible machine intelligence that had massacred great swaths of the Anthorian Republic was finally destroyed in 512 AL. That same year, the Greater Terran Empire unleashed a weapon of mass destruction identical to that used by the Skrek on a defenseless world within the neighboring Tavarite Republic. Antares was left in a state of shock struggling to find purpose when their single great effort had only served to unleash a greater evil upon the galaxy. The integration of the Skrek was in many ways a greater campaign than the invasion of their worlds. Unfathomably old, to have their ancient ruling caste, their traditions and society replaced by the Confederacy's occupation forces, created feelings of consternation or terror among their race that dwarfed any that had arisen across the rest of Antares. Slowly, however, those amenable to the Confederacy presented themselves to form a growing provisional government. With renewed stability came the opportunity to study the great vaults of knowledge that the Skrek had hoarded across the centuries and millennia. A legion of Antares scientists, engineers, and scholars pored over the archives of the Skrek. The greatest secrets of the universe were open to Antares, and the advancements they brought to the Confederacy helped soothe the relentless anguish and hatred that so many races felt towards that ancient fallen empire. With the knowledge secured from the Skrek, worlds across the Confederacy were transformed into paradises. Ancient foundries were repurposed to create new centers of industry and power, and plans were drawn and the foundations laid for an artificial world without any equal in the galaxy. But the greatest discovery within the archives of the Skrek was a towering black obelisk, venerable even to the Skrek themselves. The shifting patterns of glowing eldritch lights that emanated from deep beneath its surface were unmistakable. It was a countdown, a countdown to a date, not centuries, decades, or even years away but mere months. It was the closest thing to a religious relic within the dominion of the Skrek, and those tasked with its care had sacrificed themselves well before the first Confederate forces had landed on their world. Those that remained could only guess at its purpose. As the countdown turned from weeks to days, the subtle rise of subspace power across the galaxy became overwhelming. And then, on March 3rd, 517 AL, the countdown reached its end. The tear that formed in reality splintered communications for months. Only fragmented and conflicting accounts of terrible shapes in the darkness and the annihilation of entire worlds reached Antares, all too appalling to be believed. The Confederacy's own reconnaissance of the affected area was similarly garbled and confused but it was clear something had arrived within the galaxy. Since the first diplomats of Antares met their counterparts from Earth, the Confederacy had come to believe that the Skrek saw in humanity nothing but a slave race that could be used to restore their ancient glory. Too late was it realized that the true purpose of the United Terran Protectorates was to provide a bulwark against a greater threat. No true translation could be produced from the Skrek warnings only that their primeval foe had again arrived, one they named the Unbidden. In Stellaris Invicta, the Templin Institute guides the Antares Confederacy into an uncertain future, one you can influence. One hour after this video has gone live, we'll be streaming the journey of the Antares Confederacy on our Twitch channel, where our viewers will be able to help shape the history of the galaxy.
Until then, the Charge of the Seventh Fleet, a new piece of artwork commissioned to commemorate the events of this episode, is available for purchase on the Templin Commissary. You'll find the links in the description below.